Hey everyone, here we go with the next 10 in my top 100. What's up, Brew Crew? Welcome back to my top 100 games of all time. Uh, this week I'm going through numbers 70 to 61, so let's get going. 70. Number 70 is Seven Wonders Duel. Our original Seven Wonders was already on my list at number 94, and like a lot of other folks, I like this two player version just a little bit better. Uh, drafting for two players can be difficult to do well, and I love how it was done in this game. It adds back in a lot of the tension by giving you that added decision, do I want to take this card I need, and potentially reveal one that could really help my opponent. Um, I also like the fact that you always have to be on your toes because there are multiple ways to win. You've always got to be watching out for opportunities to grab military or science cards because even if you're not going that route, you can't let your opponent get them all. We do have the Pantheon expansion, but we haven't played it yet, and that's mainly because I'm currently undefeated against Jen in this game. I'm trying to hold on to that as long as possible. 69. Number 69 is Targi. So two back-to-back two-player only games, uh, which is kind of interesting. Targi is an amazing two-player worker placement game where you will be placing your workers around the edge of a grid of cards to take actions, and then you'll gain the cards in the middle of the grid where your workers' row and columns intersect. This is one of the most intense two-player games I think I've ever played, because the entire time your opponent is taking their turn, you are watching and waiting, hoping that they do not take that one spot that you need to get that card you want. I mean, you're always going to get something at least, but it's so tense between the time you place your first worker down and watching your opponent figure out their move and place their worker to see if you'll be able to get that spot you want. These cards that you'll be gathering from the center of the play area will either give you more resources or will be trouble cards, which are cards that will provide additional scoring either on their own or through some sort of set collection. I originally had the German edition because it was the only edition I could get my hands on for the longest time, but I was finally able to get an English copy and I passed on my pasted up copy to a friend. 68. Number 68 is the first of two Garfield Trilogy games on this portion of the list, and that's Raiders of the North Sea. Now this is by far my favorite game of the North Sea Trilogy, and very nearly my favorite of all of the Garfield Trilogies. Uh, although it is possible that Wayfarers of the South Tigris might end up overtaking it. I think I mentioned in my last video how I had three of the Garfield Directional Trilogy games all pretty close to each other on this list. And like I said in that video, really any of these three could be switched around depending on how long it's been since I've played them and what that experience was like for me. Uh, Raiders was the first game that really made me take notice of these games, and I really like how it changed up the idea of worker placement. Uh, each turn you are placing a worker and taking a worker, and you have to hope that the spot that you want to take is open, or that there's a worker to take depending on what order you need to take your actions in. The timing is tricky, and that's really what I love about it. 67. Number 67 is another Viking-themed game, and that's 878 Vikings. Now, I wasn't upset when Vikings were a popular theme there for a while, and this was the most historically-themed Viking game that I've played. Uh, this is from Academy Games, who are more or less known for their Birth of America series, which include 1754 Conquest, 1775 Rebellion, and 1812 Invasion of Canada. Uh, 878 Vikings is the first and so far only in their line that they are calling the Birth of Europe series, which shares a lot of the same mechanisms with their other historical games from what I understand. This is also one of the few non-party team games that I've played. Uh, in this game, wave after wave of Vikings will land on the shores of England. One team or players 
uh, play as the Norsemen and Berserkers who are trying to take over towns and villages. And the other team or players uh, play as the Housecarls and Thanes trying to fight off the invaders. The majority of the gameplay is done using cards to maneuver your armies and trigger events. Uh, and I tend to really like this style of game, but combat can sometimes really drag on uh, because they tend to get very complicated and cumbersome. A78 Vikings uses a fairly quick and easy to understand dice rolling mechanism with custom dice to determine the outcome of these battles. So the flow of the game isn't interrupted for too long when something exciting happens. I think I own just about everything for this game, uh, including the expansion, the Neoprene playmat, and the leader miniatures. 66. Number 66 is Crusaders Thy Will Be Done. Uh, this is another one of those rare games that uses the Mancala mechanism. The cool twist here is that most Mancala games will give you actions based on where your where your tokens end. Crusaders gives you the actions based on where you initially pick your tokens up from. Now, this is a small change, but it does make a pretty big impact on the timing and how you want to set yourself up for your next turn. We back this game uh, back when Tasty Minstrel Games kickstarted it, and we got the Deluxified Edition, which is really nice. Uh, this game has players taking on roles of different knights, orders, and traveling across Europe, setting up banks and building castles. You'll also be fighting with other factions, such as the Saracens, Prussians, and the Slavs. Uh, there's no direct player conflict, but the board definitely starts to feel pretty tight at the end of the game when you're trying to race your opponents to get a bonus token or find an empty space to build a building. Uh, we also have been playing this with the Divine Influence expansion as well, uh, which I think really improved the gameplay, especially the Influence action. Now, rather than just using the Influence action to gain points, you instead use it to claim Influence tokens in different regions on the board, and these tokens will give you points, but they will also give you some sort of benefit as well. They also allow you to place your coat of arms token in that region, which will essentially let you skip that region when it comes to movement. So not only is the influence action more interesting, but it also provides a way to travel across the map easier, especially once you get to the end of the game and you have to travel farther to find empty regions. 65. My number 65 is Pulsar 2849. This game is by one of my favorite designers, Vladimir Suchi. This game is a bit of a trickster because the cover makes it look like an epic space game, when in actuality it's a pretty dry Euro game. The main mechanism here is dice drafting, which is a mechanism you're going to see several more times on this top 100. Uh, according to the game's flavor text, we've harnessed the power of pulsars and are sending our spaceships out to claim pulsars build gyrodynes, and explore planets. Uh, one of my favorite things about how the dice drafting works in this game is that each round after you roll the dice, you'll set the median of all the dice, and then drafting dice on one side or the other can cause you to gain or lose resources or turn order. So it requires a fair bit of balance to be able to accomplish everything you want to be able to accomplish in this game. There are other dice drafting games on this list, but this is the only one that I feel requires this level of consideration as to which die you are taking. 64. Number 64 is Port Royal. This is one of the earliest games from another favorite designer of mine, Alexander Pfister. This is also one of the latest games from Mr. Pfister, at least that I have played. Uh, this is very much a push your luck card game. On your turn, you're going to flip over cards from a draw deck one at a time. These cards will often have crew members, which you can spend money to hire to your ship's crew. But they also might have missions, which can be completed for extra points if you have the right symbols on your crew cards, or they might show naval ships. And this is where the push your luck comes in. You can take a ship's card for certain amount of gold on each ship card, but also the more ships from different countries you have turned over, 
the more cards you are allowed to take or purchase from the cards that have been flipped. But if you ever flip a second ship from a country whose ship has already been flipped, then you bust and your turn is immediately over. It's really fun and really exciting as you're turning the cards over. I also love that the money is printed on the back side of the cards, meaning that there's no money tokens to keep track of, so it travels well, but also the money is taken, taking those cards out of the draw deck, which switches up the cards that are going to be available for each game. Uh, they just released a big box edition of this a couple years ago, which we've picked up, that includes uh, the expansion content. But even if you just play with the base game, there's a lot of game just in this deck of cards. 63. Number 63 is Suburbia. Now, I don't have the big fancy super deluxe version of this one, but I still think it's a fantastic game. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this was one of the first city building style games that I ever played, and it's still my favorite. This game is all about buying tiles which represent different homes, buildings, and businesses that you're going to put into your suburb of a shared main city. You're trying to grow your income and reputation to gain population, but the more population you gain, the more income you need, and the more re reputation you lose. It's a really clever balancing act. Uh, another thing that I love about this game is that all of the tiles you put into your suburb can combo off of each other. Your residential buildings want to be near parks and schools, not near the slaughterhouse. It's a fantastic puzzle that I'll admit took me a little bit to learn how to keep track of, but once I got the hang of it, I really fell in love with the game. I will admit that I was a little tempted by the Giant Deluxe version, but every once in a while I have a wild streak of common sense and I realized that it would take up too much room on my shelves. 62. Number 62 is No Thanks. Uh, this is a classic bidding game that still comes out pretty regularly for us, especially in social situations. This game is great because it takes the idea of bidding and turns it on its head. Rather than seeing who can bid the most to take a card, you are instead bidding to not take cards. Each card has a point value on it from 3 to 35, and you are trying to have the lowest score at the end of the game. A card is flipped over, and you go around the table dropping a little bid token onto the card, and at a certain point, one of two things will probably happen. Either someone runs out of tokens and has to take the card, or the number of tokens on the card is high enough that someone decides to take it to increase their bidding power later on. Uh, those bidding tokens will also subtract from your total score at the end of the game to help bring your score down as well. The other thing to watch out for is that you are, as you are collecting cards, you will only ever score the lowest card in a run. So if I have a 13, 14, 15, 16, only the 13 will score. But at the beginning of the game, a certain number of cards are randomly discarded, so it's possible that you never see the 15, and now you're scoring the 13 and the 16. It's very easy to understand the rules, and the game plays so fast that we usually end up playing three or four games of this in a row. 61. And the last game on this portion of the list, number 61, is Paladins of the West Kingdom. This is my highest ranked of the Garfield Directional Trilogy games as of right now. I know I probably sound like a broken record at this point, but... Really, any of these three could be switched around depending on how long it's been since I've played them and what that experience was like for me. Like most games in the West Kingdom trilogy, Paladins puts a cool twist on the worker placement mechanism. In this one, you'll start each round by choosing a Paladin card, which will tell you which types of workers you'll get for the round, as well as what special power you'll be able to use for that round. So you have to plan carefully because certain spaces require certain workers. Unlike most worker placement games, though, in this one you aren't competing for spaces on a main board. Everyone has their own board with worker placement spaces, and really it's all about your, using your workers the most effectively. 
Uh, there is still a central board where players will compete to place buildings and gain bonuses, but you'll never be blocked out of an action space, which is an interesting concept for a worker placement game. This one ranks up there among the crunchiest of the Garfield Trilogy games, but again, I have yet to play Scholars of the South Tigris, which looks like it could take that title. All right, everyone, thanks so much for hanging out with me for my 70 to 61. If you're watching this when it comes out, I hope that all of my American friends have a wonderful Thanksgiving, and be sure to check out uh, next week my 60 to 51. And until next time, let's get another round for the table.